Buenos dias todos. Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I am David Ortiz. I am the faculty fellow for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies CLABS. And uh, welcome to our third and last speaker series event for this semester. Um, thank you for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Bienvenidos todos. Buenas tardes. Eh, Yo soy David Ortiz, el fellow del Centro de Estudios Latinoamericanos y de la Frontera en NMSU. Bienvenidos a nuestra última presentación de este semestre. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. So, today we have a really interesting panel on the peace process in Colombia and the conflict in Colombia. So, I want to thank uh, Felipe Carranza. Dr. Julia Solver and Dr. Robert Carl for joining us. The three of them are here and um, are each going to talk to us about a different part of the process of this very long and drawn out process in Colombia. And um, we hopefully will have a really, really interesting set of presentations and discussion afterwards. Um, what The way we will proceed is we will first have uh, Mr. Felipe Carranza present, then Dr. Julia Zolver present, and then Dr. Robert Carl present. So I will introduce each one of them in turn. And at the end, you can all ask questions um, online. There is a Q&A button here in your Zoom that you can use to start asking questions. You can use it at any time. You don't have to wait till the end. We'll start sorting through those questions, and then we will ask them at the end in the discussion. So thank you for doing that. Um, if you want to follow us, please, uh, in the chat, uh, we will post our social media presence, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and, of course, also YouTube. This presentation, this panel discussion will be available in YouTube by next week. So if you could not make it, uh, just contact us, our email, uh, contact us in any of our mailing list, join our mailing list, and we will send you an alert for when this gets posted. Okay, without further ado, uh, I'll start the introduction of uh, Mr. Felipe Carranza. Felipe, welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, honored and happy of being here. Good, glad. So. Uh, Mr. Carranza is a Colombian lawyer. Uh, for more than 10 years, he has analyzed and carried out research about the Colombian armed conflict, its impacts on people and territories, and the transitional justice efforts that have been implemented by the stent to put an end of the war to the war. He also has worked closely with victims and communities affected, as well as perpetrators and the institutions in charge of the recognition and satisfaction of victims' rights such as the National Center for Historical Memory, the Office of the General Attorney, and the Colombian Army, and the Special Jurisdiction for Peace. In this talk, Mr. Carranza will address uh, some of the issues that originated the armed conflict, the context in which the peace agreement was reached, and some of the main challenges that lie ahead for its implementation. So we are both honored and lucky to have Mr. Carranza here because his particular uh, experience will give us a really interesting overview and uh, of the background of the conflict. So, Mr. Carranza, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you so much again. Thanks to you and hi to everyone. Okay, uh, I'm from Colombia. Mm, uh, right now I'm in Bogota, the capital city of, of, of our country. Uh, I apologize in advance if my English is not very good. Uh, I'm, 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 doing my best to, to, to say some things to you uh, about the peace process that we are um, enrolled in and the many ways we've tried to, we, we have tried to, to put an end to our intern armed conflict. Uh, so uh, by the first time I asked how familiar all of you would be with uh, our peace process, our peace agreement, uh, our context. Uh, and I was told that uh, it could be good if I, do uh, to start uh, if I make a, a brief recount uh, and I give you a brief context of what is Colombia, how is Colombia, and uh, how this uh, agreement was reached and why was it important and 
and how is it designed? So first of all, what and how is Colombia? I like to like to think and I like to say that in the northwestern corner of South America lies a territory surrounded by two oceans uh, and filled with a great numbers of species, rivers, mountains, deserts, and every kind of people. This is a really diverse country. It's multicultural. People are passionate, joyful, and has a lot of ideas and, and a lot of um, ways to make things happen. But in more occasions than we would like to, to, to accept those ideas and that cleverness have been used for the uh, for purposes that are not very good. Uh, that's how we came to a um, difficult uh, armed conflict. Uh, one that uh, we like to think that uh, started in the middle of the past century around 1954, uh, 1954, some others put it more in the 60s. But the thing that, uh, the thing is that we have been fighting with some evils uh, like selfishness, abuse of power, corruption, and of course, um, illicit drugs. And maybe that's something that you've heard more often than not, um, because uh, sadly our country became famous uh, at least some years ago, uh, because of the, its uh, capacity of producing uh, illicit drugs, mainly uh, for the cultivation of the coca leaf, which uh, can be converted into cocaine, are some others. And uh, as we will see today, uh, it has been some of the fuel of, the, of our armed conflict. But so uh, in the midst of that armed conflict, in the midst of that uh, situation of violence, of uh, of conflict, of social conflicts, political conflicts. We've seen the rise of many uh, criminal structures and armed, armed forces being FARC EP, the most notorious one or the most known one. Mm, and uh, with that group, with that specific group, in 2012, uh, the Colombian government started a peace process and finally reached a peace agreement on December of 2016. In the middle of, of, of that time span, and I like to address here uh, some of the causes that uh, some people have uh, thought as the, as the roots of our armed conflict. Mm, in the middle of, of, of that time span, uh, in February of 2015, the negotiators, uh, both, both sides of the, of the table, uh, the government and the FARC, commissioned a group of intellectuals, historians, and violentologists, because yes, that's a thing here in, in Colombia, people who have dedicated its academic and professional life to study violence. So they commissioned these guys to analyze uh, armed conflict, its origins, its causes, and the impacts that it has left on people and, its, and, and Colombian population. So uh, they set up this diverse panel of 14 brilliant people who obviously, could not reach an unified uh, narrative of our conflict. Neither was that was their purpose to do so. But they did agree on some matters, like the lack of political participation uh, or the inequities on rural territories, and some of the as some of the main causes of war. And as I said before, the traffic of narcotics as a possible explanation for its perpetuation and uh, and its. Um, it's growing uh, every every year. But what am I telling this? What am I referring to those uh, academics who try to, to put a name to the causes of our armed conflict? Because it isn't a coincidence that uh, once the final agreement was reached, um, it was uh, designed uh, and it was uh, organized in a way that uh, they reached an, an agenda and a final agreement focused on different uh, subjects and different matters that I like to uh, classify as, as the way that that follows. Mm, so the final agreement contains provisions that are divided in six main points, six principal categories of, of issues that should be addressed in order to put an end to our conflict. And the first one, one of those, uh, as I said before, um, I, I like to classify them in, in favor of what are they destined to do? What's the purpose of that, of, that, of that point of the agreement? So we have 
one point, the point number six uh, of the agreement, that was destined to the logistics around the finalization of the agreement. Its name is, is implementation, verification, and public endorsement of the agreement and of the reaching piece. What does it has to do? Uh, well, it, it has the provisions and it has mandates regarding the international verification of the, of the complying of the agreement, um, the international verification mission in charge of doing so, how, we, how the implementation of the agreement would be monitored, or um, some, uh, some provisions about the information and transparency system to know uh, how, is it, how is it going. So we have a first point dedicated to mainly the logistics or maybe the, the participation of many parties uh, in the supervision and the monitoring of the agreement. Secondly, we have two points that were uh, dedicated or that were meant to uh, realize the finalization of work in a stricto sensu, uh, were points that were looking to uh, stop the armed confrontation and we're points three and five of the agreement. Point number three is named end of conflict, and it had provisions regarding the laying down of arms or the cantonment process, uh, and it was uh, supposed and it aimed to simply stop fighting. Uh, the, were the provisions uh, directed to make the parties to stop fighting? And the other one is the point number five, which, is, which addresses the rights of the victims of conflict. So point number five, it's dedicated to um, establish the way how truth, justice, and reparations will be achieved and the guarantees of non-repetitions in order to avoid new victims to, to happen or to appear in, in Colombia. Uh, it has some, some provisions like the truth commission, or the special jurisdiction for peace, uh, the tribunal that it's in charge of the judgment of the um, of the maximum responsibles uh, in our armed conflict. But finally, we have another category that I think is the most important one of the final agreement. Uh, this category uh, uh, regroups the um, the provisions or the or the agreements at, that look to transform the conditions of the society. It's the more transformative component of the agreement. And I like to, to make a stop here because um, those uh, academics, uh, historians, or violentologists that I, that I mentioned before, found out that uh, besides the subjective causes of conflict, subjective causes of war, uh, meaning the disposition of people of groups to raise in arms or make war, there were some objective causes and some structural causes, some situations that uh, laid, a, laid a ground for, uh, for social uh, discontent and that became finally uh, our armed conflict. So these three points of the final agreement are, the, are, are what I like to call the transformative component of the agreement. And uh, are, are mainly constituted by point one, which is named towards a new Colombian countryside. Uh, it has provisions regarding the access and use of land, the development plans with territorial focus or the rural reform. There was a, there was a, a people identified a need for, um, for rural people, for farmers to have a better access to the land they work, to the land that they live on, so uh, the lack of distribution of that, uh, of that land, of, that, of those properties have caused uh, bad living conditions in the, in the countryside. So uh, the negotiators at the table found out that they needed to solve this uh, in order to avoid uh, more conflict to appear. Point number two of the um, final agreement is named political participation for a democratic opening. As I said before, there was a lack of representation. There was a lack of opportunities to participate in the democratic process in Colombia. And that's why some people many years ago, many decades before today, uh, decided to raise in arms and try to uh, get the power by the, by the, by the way of fighting. Uh, so the negotiator, the negotiator said like, um, it's time to allow people to participate more 
to get involved more in the state things, uh, in the in the state business, if, if we want to, um, and that way they stipulated provisions about the guarantees for the political opposition, the promotion of the citizen participation, or the promotion of the electoral participation and the and the and the transparency of the of the electoral processes. And finally, point four. Uh, regards the solution to the problem of illicit drugs. Mm, you can say that you can see that uh, illicit drugs have been uh, a, a, an issue here in Colombia. The possibility of uh, transform uh, some nature, uh, herbs, uh, leaves, plants into something that uh, is valued outside uh, outside our country as. Um, as a drug, as, a, as, a, as an illicit drug, as a narcotic, uh, has created many problems because it brings money that means fuel for the conflict. Uh, how uh, clandestine guerrilla can be able to survive it for more than 50 or 60 years in the mountains making work because they they got to the money that was brought by, by, by the, the traffic of illicit drugs. Uh, and many others, uh, armed groups or criminal structures that have uh, have risen during those uh, time span also have had the money, uh, the access to the money bring by, by by drugs. So, in the point in the point number four of the um, of the final agreement, were uh, presented provisions like this substitution program in which farmers or coca leaf growers could replace those crops with licit and legal uh, crops, uh, a plan for the consumption prevention and public health programs, and an strategy against drug trafficking assets. That's some of the main points of those of those of those parts of the agreement. Uh, so there we can raise the question of how is how is it going? Uh, we have a, a brief, a brief, a brief, um, a brief resume or a brief uh, abstract of, of how it is, how it's constituted and how it's going. And that way uh, we go uh, briefly again to uh, one of the ways of monitoring that was, um, that was introduced into the agreement because uh, Institute Croc, uh, an institute from an university located in the United States was uh, asked to uh, have the monitor to, to monitor the implementation of the agreement and to see how good uh, were we going with them with the realization of the provisions stipulated in the final agreement. They created a, methodolo a methodology that methodology was uh, was approved by the government and the representatives of, of the Guerrilla Park. And so they decided that they could um, create a matrix. They designate, they design a matrix with a, with a total of 578 stipulations that were included in the agreement. Those were uh, complete. Those were excuse me. Those those were concrete, observable, and measurable commitments made and, and inserted into the agreement. So they could see how is it going and if they are completed or not. And they uh, created like um, a, a way to measure them in four different uh, statuses. So uh, they, they are analyzing if, if each one of those 500 provisions is complete, is in intermediate advance, advance in minimum advance or not even initiated. And that's the final thing that I want to Put here uh, on the table, uh, and and it it resumes and 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 it uh, completes uh, the the sensation that I want to leave you about the implementation process in Colombia. As I said before, oh, I'm, uh, should I store? Should I stop here, uh, the, uh, David, or can I go for two or three more minutes? You can continue. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, as I said before, point six was the more like logistical one, uh, the one for the for the um, for the implementation and verification, and is at, and it is complete on a fifty eight percent. It's complete on a fifty eight percent. Fifty eight percent of 
the provisions that regard to that point have been successfully completed, while other 14% is in intermediate advance. That makes it for 72% of, 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 of a good advance. But as you can see, that's not very transformative. That just, that's just how we are going to monitor the implementation. Uh, point three and five, which I mentioned as the as putting an end of the arm to the armed conflict, are advanced in a forty nine and twenty seven percent respectively, uh, with a nineteen percent and twenty seven percent of intermediate advance. That puts it in some of like sixty nine and fifty four percent of 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 advance uh, of total advance. But again. Those are the points that were supposed to put an end to war. So it's good that it, it is on 69 and 54% of advancement, but it should be even higher uh, because, uh, because uh, fighting has already stopped. What's the concern here? That the main points that are supposed to transform the conditions that made way for the armed conflict to happen are not that. Uh, actually, point one, the one of the rural reform, only 4% of the provisions are complete. Uh, about point two, the one uh, dedicated to the political participation and political transformation is only 14%, while uh, the fight against the illicit drugs is on 23%. Mm, that leaves us uh, with, a, with a really, with big concerns about how good has been really the implementation of the of, of, of our peace agreement? Uh, if we are just uh, putting an end to war, uh, if we are just uh, trying to give victims an answer, uh, and if we are just uh, securing that people are not in arms anymore, that guns are let down. But uh, if one of the main uh, characteristics of our peace agreement was that uh, it was bigger than just war, it was bigger than just putting an end to the fightings, uh, we have to be concerned if we see that the, the, the truly uh, transformative component of the agreement has not advanced uh, really good. I have some more uh, thoughts to, to share uh, about the challenges ahead, but I think uh, we could um, listen to Julia and Carl and keep talking about this a, a bit later. Thank you so much, Felipe. Um, our next uh, presenter is Dr. Julia Sulver or Julia Sulver. Uh, and uh, Dr. Julia Sulver is a Marie Slodowska Curie Research Fellow at the Oxford School of um, Global and Area Studies. Um, and the Instituto de Investigaciones Jurídicas in UNAM, Mexico, my alma mater. So her work investigates women's high risk leadership in Latin America with a focus on Mexico, El Salvador, and Colombia. She has extensive research and practitioner experience along the Colombia-Venezuela border, where she supported Lady Smith's Cosas de Mujeres gender data project with vulnerable women. She earned her doctorate in sociology. Uh, again, another thing we shared, uh, uh, sociologist from the University of Oxford in 2018. Her book, High Risk Feminism in Colombia, was published by Rutgers University Press in May 2022 and Ediciones Uniandes and Fescol in September 2022. Uh, Dr. Julia Sulver plans to address the gender dimensions of the conflict and peace process in terms of conflict related gender violence. Uh, the participation and inclusion of women in the peace negotiations and final accord, the ongoing struggles and challenges faced by women in Colombia, and the implications of the new government for gender equality moving forward. We are very honored and thankful that Dr. Julia Sorler has joined us. Julia, please. Thank you so much for that introduction, David, and thank you so much for having me on this panel. I'm always excited to talk about my research, particularly with such distinguished colleagues. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually maps onto what Felipe was talking about in the previous presentation. However, I'm going to overlay a lens over all of these different moments in time 
And the lens that I'm gonna overlay is a gender lens. So one that looks at what happens or that would that reveals to us what happens when we understand those socially constructed power dynamics between what it means to be men and what it means to be women um, in the middle of a civil conflict and its aftermath. So during Colombia's armed conflict, which again, Felipe spoke about a little bit, one of the, the factors that uh, stand out is that gender violence was used widely um, throughout the course of um, the last five decades. So if we look, for example, at Colombia's Victims Unit, which is a special unit that was put into place with the 2011 transitional justice laws, um, this is a, a space where victims of the armed conflict can register the different violences that they suffered. And if we look at that, uh, that registry, that official documentation, we see that just over half or about 4.7 million of the people who have registered um, that they suffered during the armed conflict are women. And within that, one of the biggest um, kind of focuses we often have as scholars of gender and conflict is looking at conflict related sexual violence. So namely uh, rape and other forms of sexual violence. And we see that in Colombia's armed conflict, there are around 34,000 registered cases. However, we know that that number is likely to be much, much higher, um, and that it's mainly a question of women uh, and men in some cases not having registered with the victims unit because um, of a, they're, they're afraid of retribution um, or they have ongoing shame and trauma around uh, registra registering and they don't want to make this something public. And so we know that those statistics are likely to be low. Um, of the other kind of 4.6 million-ish, uh, the vast majority have been victims of forced displacement. And so Johnny Neerton's, for example, writes a lot about how when women are forcibly displaced out of their land, out of their homes, that this has an impact on the family, for example. Uh, we also see that other crimes that people suffer during the armed conflict, men and women have gendered um, implications. So for example, if a man is killed and he was the main breadwinner in a family, often then women have to take over that income earning uh, role within the house, as well as continuing to take care of children, as well often as having to move their children and go to a safer town or city after being forced off their land. And so we see that women have suffered differentially throughout the armed conflict in many ways. Um, some ways, as I say, that are kind of amplifier effects or knock-on effects of um, violence that happened against men, and also in some ways they were directly targeted. And for example, I included a quote here from Colombia's Constitutional Court um, in a, an auto that they made in 2008, where they really recognize women's differential experiences of armed conflict in the country. And they talk about how conflict-related sexual violence was a habitual extensive, systematic, and invisible practice in the context of the Colombian armed conflict, perpetrated by all of the illegal armed groups and in isolated areas by individual agents of the national armed forces. So what we're seeing here is that this kind of violence against women was actually a strategy of war. It was a strategy in many ways that was used for not only territorial control, these armed groups coming in and taking over the lands, the crops, the little towns, um, but also of social control. So of the people who lived in those spaces. And because of the way um, that women and women's roles are uh, socially constructed, um, using violence against women and then their bodies in this way is a strategy we've seen all over the world, but, but definitely in Colombia in, um, in terms of tools of domination. So in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk not now, not only about uh, gender in conflict, which I've mentioned, but now more about gender in the context of the peace process itself. So uh, for those of you who know about the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, or which gave rise to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, um, again, this is a big international uh, framework architecture agenda, I suppose, which recognizes that not only in Colombia, but all over the world in conflict settings, women uh, not only suffer differentially, but also they need to be included in all moments of peace building. So from negotiations, uh, being at the negotiating table, 
to having the women's issues included in peace uh, processes or peace accords to having them involved in post-conflict reconstruction. And this was definitely the case in the context of Colombia's armed conflict. And so uh, when the peace accords went through in 2016, they've been heralded internationally as being some of the most gender sensitive in the world. So again, recognizing that women suffer differently based on uh, the socially constructed meanings around what it is to be a man and a woman. Um, and recognizing that violence, also recognizing that women need to have guarantees to their rights included specifically within the uh, peace accords themselves. And then thinking about how women can be involved in, in rebuilding society um, in the wake of conflict, which I'm going to get to uh, in a moment. I'm not going to call it a post-conflict moment necessarily. And that's something I think that we can definitely also discuss with, with Felipe and Carl. Carl after, uh, sorry, <laughs> and Rob, uh, after we, um, we finish uh, with the presentations. So uh, as Felipe mentioned in 2012, uh, the government of Colombia began negotiating with the FARC uh, in Havana. Uh, and what was really interesting is that although there was a lot of pressure internationally, women weren't really included in any significant or meaningful way. And so with a lot of mobilizing from Colombia's feminist organizations at the national level, at the local level, and also with pressure from international um, feminist organizations. And also interestingly, from women within the FARC itself, women um, guerrilleras, they really pressured to create this gendered subcommission. And the idea was that this, uh, this separate table, this separate space would really engage with how to mainstream women's specific issues throughout all parts of the, the final peace accords. And so it wasn't until about 2014 that this subcommission was created. But again, when it was, this meant that women from civil society, women from government, women from the FARC, could sit, women victims of the conflict could sit down in Havana and really negotiate and discuss what it means to include this just gender perspective throughout the accords. And as I already shadowed to or alluded to, um, it was incredibly successful in terms of having this final accord that really did represent women's experiences uh, of violence and also um, talk about how women should be involved in the implementation of this peace accord. Um, and so throughout the, the, the final accord itself, we do see this gender perspective included in a really meaningful way that, as I say, uh, was heralded and has been heralded, heralded around the world as being particularly important um, and successful. And so here is a photo that I took actually in, this is October, maybe September, no, but September 2016, right before uh, the peace accord went to a national plebiscite where the government of Juan Manuel Santos asked um, the Colombian people whether to vote on whether or not they wanted to approve the final content of the peace accord. Um, this is a, a march that I went to, or a rally that I went to in Barranquilla, which is on the north uh, coast of Colombia in the Caribbean. And this is where women from all over the Caribbean coast came together, victims of the armed conflict, people who had suffered uh, tremendously throughout the armed conflict, not just under the FARC, but under other armed groups as well, under the government as well, and really to promote the C vote, the yes vote, uh, to approve the, the passage of this accord. However, um, which was not in a, in a way that was perhaps not predicted by many, uh, the plebiscite actually failed. The no vote won by a very small margin. And really interestingly, and this is probably a conversation for a different day, but one of the reasons that's attributed to why the peace, uh, the, the plebiscite, well, why the no won, is because there was a very big narrative and kind of marketing campaign by the no side, uh, by the no camp, around this inclusion of gender ideology. The term gender ideology is never actually used within the accord itself, but there was this um, kind of demonizing or vilifying of what that meant um, and, and framing it as being a threat to traditional family values. And so that is um, something that was that is cited as one of the reasons that the, the plebiscite didn't go through. However, the plebiscite, the, sorry, the accords went back to the negotiating table, went back to the drawing table. Um, they did some changing, they did some changing of wording and eventually the peace accord was uh, finally approved in December of that year. 
And what's happened in the years since the, the approval of the accord in, in late 2016 has been this real push to implement the peace accord. However, again, as Felipe has alluded to, the what exists on paper and what exists on practice in practice uh, really is not the same thing. There's a big difference between uh, this really inc incredible gender perspective, how it exists in words within the accords themselves, and what this looks like on the ground. And so um, Felipe mentioned that there are specific uh, verification or ways of kind of monitoring, verifying the implementation of the accord. And for example, the the Kroc Institute out of Notre Dame is in charge of this matrix project where they're doing some of this, this monitoring. And in their latest report, I think it's their latest report, the latest one that I've seen, um, they mentioned that of the 133 provisions within the peace accords that relate specifically to um, this gender perspective and this implementation of a gender perspective, that 41% have not been implemented at all and 35% have been implemented only to a really minimal amount. And so what we see here is that after the peace accord went through and with the election of a conservative government under Ivan Duque, there was a lot of kind of pushback or stalling or breaking of the actual implementation. And so for women's organizations, and this is a picture um, of a mural that was created by one of the women's organizations I've worked with over the years in Putumayo in the southern part of the country at the border with Ecuador, we see that these women are, um, women from civil society are really working to uh, engage in programs around women's access to land, around women's political participation, around women's economic empowerment, and also around women's right to truth and justice. So having women go and declare their cases, for example, to the victims unit that I mentioned before. Um, to ask not only for reparations, but also to include this within historical memory documents, within the Truth Commission, um, before different mechanisms like the HIP, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more. Yet, a lot of what my research focuses on is how these women who have gone out to really implement this gender perspective and this gender focus and this reconstruction, again, I'm not going to say post-conflict, but uh, kind of this post-accord reconstruction of society um, are now doing so at great personal risk. So other armed groups which have come in after the demobilization of the FARC to again begin to clash for social and territorial control um, have targeted the women that I work with specifically uh, not only because they're engaging in community cohesion, they're engaging in social projects because they're trying to create this uh, rebuild this social fabric, but also because as women, they are doing so uh, in, in um, kind of a transgression of what their, like what role they're supposed to fill into society is. And that role that they're supposed to fulfill is based on uh, traditional patriarchal values whereby women are supposed to be at home, taking care of children, um, cooking, cleaning, and particularly not engaging in any kind of political or um, socio-political uh, organizing or making public demands. And so, as, as I said, the work that I do really focuses on this backlash violence that a lot of these women social leaders are facing in the aftermath of the peace accord. I will say that it's not just women, um, absolutely many more men are being targeted and are being killed uh, in this, this in the last few years since the signing of the peace accord. However, um, it's important to mention, as I already highlighted, that when it comes to women, there's that additional element of violence and retributive punishment because they're engaging in social leadership, but also because of their gender. However, not to leave things kind of on too uh, depressing of a note, I wanna take the last few minutes to talk about hope for the future and what this means uh, in relation to the June elections this year. So this year, for the first time in June, Colombia elected its first uh, leftist government, its first openly leftist government. So that's Petro, uh, Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez as his VP. This is a mural or a photo of a mural that I took of Francia Marquez. The murals in her hometown in Suarez in Cauca, which is um, a, a province of Colombia, which historically and contemporarily is really battered by armed conflict and ongoing armed conflict. And Francia Marquez comes from a civil society background. She herself was an environmental social leader. Uh, she has worked 
with the women in her area for many, uh, many years, I would say decades, if I'm not wrong. Um, and she's really promoted not only this vision of including women in um, the government, but also including women's specific needs. And what's really interesting about Francia is that she's the first um, woman politician, I would actually probably say politician in Colombia, who really um, outwardly says that she's going to speak for the no bodies in the country. So she herself is Afro-Colombian, she's poor, she's a victim of the armed conflict, she comes from a rural area, and symbolically, this is incredibly important because in Colombia, historically, uh, politicians have been white, rich from the same political class, from the same few cities. And so having her in these spaces of power and at these decision, at, in these decision-making spaces really does offer an opportunity um, to bring in rural women's and rural women victims' uh, experiences to the table. And so she, for example, has created um, a ministry around equality for women, and she's named um, Clemencia Hrabali, uh, Hrabali as the one of the, the presidential advisors. Um, Clemencia is uh, another social leader from La Valta, from a, a nearby community, um, someone who I've actually worked with, who has an incredible history of social activism. And so she's now also working in these government spaces, really bringing women's experiences to the fore. And what this government says that they're going to do is after the years of the Duque government, they're actually going to implement the peace accords as they were written. So remember I mentioned that kind of difference between what exists on paper, what exists in the accord versus what exists in practice in terms of implementation, that difference there, this is where the current Petro government says that it's really going to dedicate its energies. Um, so that's about questions of access to property, guarantees of economic, social, and cultural rights, um, promoting women's political participation, getting them access to transitional justice, um, strengthening the women's movement, um, and all of this with this really specific gender focus that was written specifically into uh, their political platform as they were running up, uh, as in the run up to the election. So. Uh, may, and maybe we'll discuss this in the next presentation, but uh, you know, hope, I would say cautious optimism. There are a lot of barriers to um, this quite progressive agenda that the current government has, but hopefully uh, they will be able to push forward with some of this gender perspective that was so unique and so exciting about Colombia's peace accords as they were signed in 2016. So again, thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to speaking more as a way of Shameless self promotion. If you'd like to read more, this interests you. Uh, these are the, the books that the book, the one book, one I wrote in English and then was translated into Spanish. There's a lot more detail um, about what I've spoken about today. And um, I look forward to, to the question and answers afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Solver, for that really interesting perspective on the ways in which not only gender was included in the peace accords, but also the way that it, it's their implementation of those uh, gender issues are going. Our last but not least uh, uh, presenter today is Dr. Robert Carl. Uh, Robert Carl is a professor of arts and humanities at Minerva University, as well as a research associate and, uh, of history in, at Bowdoin College. Um, his 2017 book, Forgotten Peace, Reform, Violence, and the Making of Contemporary Colombia, that also has a Spanish translation from Libreria Learner, is a critical reference point in academic and public debates in both Colombia and the United States about Colombia's peace process. As an outgrowth of his research on Colombia's past and present, he has also served as an expert country conditions witness in the cases of more than 60 Colombian asylum seekers around the world. Uh, Dr. Carl today will talk to us about the rapidly evolving conflict, uh, politics of peace and violence in Colombia in the first months of the Petros presidency that Dr. Solver kind of referenced a little while ago. Um, and this talk will actually offer some context and contextualize recent developments in Colombia's armed conflict and the national debate over the bounds of crimes, politics and peace. Thank you so much for joining us again, Dr. Carl. We are honored to have you, and I let it all to you, Rob. Well, the honor's to, the honor is all mine, and I'm really uh, pleased to be here with my fellow panelists. And Julia, it's finally great to meet you virtually, face to face, as it were. 
So I, one other reason I appreciate uh, this opportunity to speak with you today is that usually my engagement as a historian, my engagement with the current day is looking at individual cases or patterns of regional or local cases involving the asylum seekers that I help uh, as an expert witness. So this is really has been a chance for me to step back and try to synthesize uh, some of these individual or more regionalized strands alongside some, micro, some macro trends within Colombia. And I'll mention that the sources that I utilize in my presentation um, appear in the, some citation information in the slides, but I've also just tweeted out uh, a bibliography of sources I use to prepare for today. Uh, my Twitter handle is at R.A. Carl. So this opportunity to metabolize developments around the issue of peace is even more significant given the speed at which political debates and policy changes have evolved since I was first approached to appear on this panel over the summer. Um, changes that have only accelerated since Gustavo Petro took office in August of 2022. So I'd like I'd like to begin with a map issued last month by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime as part of its annual update on coca cultivation. And I introduced this map not to reinforce the association between Colombia and its most famous export, or even to state that the illegal narcotics trade is the most important issue facing the country. Instead, I think one thing that this map does is gives us a sense of the scale of the challenges that Colombia faces around issues including illegality, violence, development, the land question, and political participation, all of which are key issues in any discussion of peace. And this map will also serve as an entry point to talking about major players in Colombia's security situation today. So the United Nations found that Coca cultivation surged 43% in 2021, from 143,000 hectares to 204,000 hectares. So for comparison, uh, that's an area about 13 times the size of Washington, D.C., and more than 10 times the size of Las Cruces. So thanks to this higher acreage for cocaine's raw ingredient, but also improvements in the refinement process, co cocaine production has also reached a historic high in 2021. Now, nearly half of Colombia's coca is concentrated in just 12 of Colombia's more than uh, 1,100 municipios or counties. And this map shows uh, the hot spots uh, in particularly the Northeast and Southwest of the country. So as you might guess, and as the arrows here indicate, these coca hotspots are located predominantly in areas with access to international borders or the ocean. So routes that would facilitate the export of cocaine hydrochloride after it's been uh, extracted from the coca leaf. Now, the drug trade is far from the sole source of revenue for armed and other criminal groups responsible for violence and the weakness of the rule of law. So for instance, uh, there's substantial overlap between coca growing areas, which are the green dots on the map at left, and also illegal mining, which is shown here in purple. Illegal mining is another activity with grave environmental consequences that armed groups engage in both to extract value, but also to launder money from other illegal activities. One of Colombia's most uh, contested conflict zones is the Bajo, Bajo Cauca or Lower Cauca River Valley. It's sort of the north central part of the country uh, to the northeast of Medellin, which is Colombia's second largest city. So here, the three largest armed groups in the country vie for control of everything from uh, illegal mines, such as the one shown here at right, uh, but also extortion payments, drug trafficking routes, and coca plots. So I'm going to return to uh, this first map uh, here and focus on three coca hotspots that are strongholds for each of the three major armed groups. That, though I'll reiterate that contestations between these groups drive significant indicators of violence from homicide to forced displacement. Now these, uh, or my cat just hopped up on the desk, you'll probably see him uh, in a moment. So these hotspots include uh, the Bajo Cauca region, which I already referenced, uh, which is sort of the major, one of the major strongholds of the AGC, the major, also known as the Urabeños, the major paramilitary successor group in Colombia. Uh, in the southwest, in Cauca, uh, the department that Julia just referenced, a particular stronghold of FARC dissident groups. And then third, in the Catatumbo region on the border with Venezuela, we have the other guerrilla group, the ELN. So to give you 
a sense of the territorial reach of these groups, as well as the scale of the problem of peace, I'm going to rely in the next few minutes on maps that the, off, the Colombian government's Office of the Human Rights Ombudsperson released earlier this year about the risk of political violence across Colombia. So these maps give us a sense for armed groups territorial reach, but also variation across regions. Uh, and I'll begin here with the AGC, which has its deepest origins in um, the paramilitary forces that emerge with the, with the development of the cocaine trade, the consolidation of the cocaine trade in Colombia in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, by the, 19, the late 1990s, the uh, paramilitary sort of phenomenon coalesced as a national movement, a sort of a fusion of private right-wing armies, but also private landowners, business interests, and elements of the Colombian state security apparatus and, and certain political elites. After the formal demobilization uh, of the main paramilitary group under Avoro Uribe in 2005-2006, uh, elements of the paramilitary apparatus kept their weapons. Significantly, the paramilitaries weren't required to disclose their funding mechanisms and their political, uh, political ties. So although the AGC today doesn't have this, the full national reach, it's not a national political project in the way that its predecessors uh, were. Uh, it is nonetheless a very significant actor. And actually, if we look at the ombudsperson's report for 2022, it is the largest source of risk uh, around voting, around political participation uh, in nearly a quarter of Columbia's counties and two thirds of its department departments. So based on the level of intensity of the AGC's involvement in hostilities and also the group's hierarchical structure and a chain of command uh, capable of planning, coordinating, and executing military operations, the International Committee of the Red Cross classifies the AGC as participants in a non-international armed conflict subject to international humanitarian law. Columbia's current transitional justice court, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, or HEP, which uh, the prior two panelists referred to, found that the AGC committed the largest number of suspected violations of international humanitarian law of any illegal armed group in Colombia in 2021. So uh, estimates for 2021 place the size of the AGC at somewhere between 16 and 1700 fighters and direct support personnel. And the AGC retains a very powerful capacity for armed action. So in May of this year, following the extradition of the AGC's founder to the United States on drug trafficking charges, the AGC launched a four-day armed strike, a paro armado, that affected 11 of Colombia's 32 departments, it included more than 300 acts of violence, more than 24 selective homicides, about as many attacks on security forces, and the forced confinement of 138 communities. So this was a show of strength to show the group's continued capabilities for uh, armed action. Uh, this is not simply a drug trafficking organization, although it is that in large part. It also has uh, political content behind it, and I'll return to that a little bit later in the talk. Significantly, the AGC also has subcontracting relationships with more regionalized and localized armed actors, anything from other paramilitary successor groups to local criminal gangs. These kinds of subcontracting hierarchical relationships are not exclusive to the AGC. Uh, the FARC, FARC dissident groups and the ELN have them as well, but I'm going to highlight it here. Um, and this is a really significant driver of a lot of forced displacement and violence uh, in Colombia today. I've worked on a number of asylum cases just in the past few months um, of Colombians who are fleeing violence from local gangs, particularly in southern Bogota, but these groups have relationships to national armed actors like the AGC. And there's really a fascinating sort of territorial reconfiguration happening around the capital uh, of the country right now. I want to move on then to talk about FARC dissident groups uh, who quadrupled in size between 2019 and 2021 to more than estimated 5,000 combatants and 2,000 urban and rural support personnel. For time reasons, I'm not going to disaggregate what FARC dissident groups uh, consist of. There are really two 
larger blocks, uh, as well as some smaller independent groups, the Segunda Marquetalia, and also a group that calls itself the FARC EP. Both of these were listed on the U.S. State Department's uh, terrorism uh, group list uh, in November about November of last year, uh, when the original FARC were delisted because of their role in uh, the peace process. Um, and also we can distinguish within the larger uh, FARC dissident movement between uh, dissidents who did not participate in the peace process of 2012 to 2016, uh, but then also deserters. So individuals and senior commanders who left the peace process sometime subsequent to its signing in 2017. There's also been a lot of recruitment of uh, new fighters for the FARC, partic particularly among the millions of Venezuelan refugees who have left uh, Venezuela for Colombia in recent years. So the third and final group uh, to focus on is the ELN, which is smaller than uh, the FARC in terms of absolute numerical numbers, but has nonetheless probably, it was increased by about 10% uh, between 2019 and 2020. And significantly, at least around half of the ELN's forces are estimated to operate from either from Venezuelan territory or within Venezuelan territory. They are really consolidating uh, their territorial and social control in Venezuela as well. So the US and Columbia based research group Insight Crime stated in late 2020 that the ELN has become, and here I quote, the most powerful criminal group in Colombia is entrenching itself in Venezuela and is also one of the principal organized crime players in the Americas. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, my sl slides here and just summarize uh, where Colombia has is with this panorama uh, following the election, the installation of Gustavo Petro as president in August of this year. One of Petro's campaign promises was what he called total peace. So an effort to sort of expand some of the gains uh, of security gains that have been squandered in the last few years um, by the Duque administration, Petro's predecessor, the gains that followed the 2016 peace accord with the FARC. So Petro has uh, called for widespread territorial negotiations across the country with all different kinds of armed groups. Earlier this month was his congressional majority. He managed to pass uh, what one of his senior ministers called sort of the setup for eventual negotiations with armed groups. So he said, we haven't figured out sort of the, the rules by which the game will be played, but we've sort of identified the general parameters uh, of what the field of play will look like. Now, this campaign for total peace has drawn criticism from a number of sides. On the one hand, uh, senior members of the ELN's leadership don't want their, their group, which they see as still a political uh, actor, they don't want it equated with more regionalized groups that are primarily dedicated to drug trafficking and social control. Other sectors within Colombia fear that uh, giving, negotiating with these groups will grant them too much sort of legitimacy within Colombia and will allow them to consolidate their territorial and social control, uh, much as happened with the paramilitaries after the, the partial demobilization of the mid 2000s. And then there are also critiques of uh, Petro's approach to uh, total peace from members of what we could call the establishment center and center left, uh, which worry that the camp a campaign for the total peace will eclipse the 2016 peace accord with the FARC, uh, which they worry will sort of get diluted as the Petro administration pushes towards total peace. And there's also some sort of institutional and legal uh, questions there that, that Felipe is, I'm sure, more qualified to talk about than I am. So to sum up, um, it's really an interesting moment uh, to be studying these issues of peace and violence in Colombia. I think Julia is correct that there are uh, some reasons for cautious optimism. In the Pacific port of Buena Aventura, which is a predominantly Afro-Colombian city, one of the most unequal cities um, within Colombia, since uh, Petro announced a total peace. Uh, the two major criminal gangs, rival criminal gangs in the city have declared uh, a ceasefire. So the city went more than a month without any homicides in the rural area. There is reason for concern uh, that because some locals complain that these groups are continuing their extortion payments, they're continuing uh, to threaten locals. But on the other hand, 
it's a vast improvement. This is Buenaventura has historically been one of Colombia's uh, most violent cities. Uh, so to see an improvement there as part of the campaign for total peace and these two criminal gangs saying we will, uh, we are interested in negotiating with the government. I think you know we we are at a very very interesting moment um, in this decades long search for peace in the country. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Carl. This was uh, really, again, very illuminating. So um, I am going to ask all of the panelists to turn on their camera so that we can have a discussion and then answer some questions. I will ask our participants to please use the Q&A button to ask any questions that you would like to see our panelists answer or at least try, try to give an idea for in, in your questions. Um, I want to start with, we, we have several questions already, but I want to start with one um, here that seems uh, really relevant um, to all of you, actually. Uh, uh, and I and I, I send it I, and I ask it to the three of you. Whoever wants to answer, whoever doesn't, it's fine. Um, it's how has President Petro's own past as a former militia member shaped his approach to this idea of a total peace? And uh, you know, all from the legal part of it, from of course the militia part of it, uh, and 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 that 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 Rob you were talking about to us and and Julia from the gender uh, portion of this if any of you that wants to start I would appreciate that so I guess I, okay no, Go ahead. no fi nope you you Felipe you <laughs> you please okay I, I I'm gonna say something uh, really brief mm. I tend to think that uh, Gustavo Petro doesn't see a great issue. I mean, let me rephrase. Uh, he's in favor of social transformations. Uh, he he is not afraid of changes. He's not afraid of. He seems to be not afraid of uh, what uh, people can see, what people can say, and he's willing to take risks. Um, for him, I think uh, a way to uh, get a stamp into history is to, to finally reach a, a piece that, that, that is comprehensive, uh, that deals with all the groups that Robert was, uh, was mentioning. And, um, and yeah, it, it's a challenge for him. But at the same time, I think he has a problem of, uh, of legitimacy uh, of, the, of the piece that he can, he can reach eventually. Because uh, ma the majority of people has problems with how many benefits can be given away to criminals uh, in exchange of what. So um, as long as today uh, is not clear what's the, the, the content of the total piece, uh, what it's going to be offered to, 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 the, to those groups, and what is going to get the the the, the state in return uh, besides the, the 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 dropping of weapons? Mm, mainly because, and, and there is a huge debate about what can be done with the people who betrayed the the, the peace the, the peace agreement, uh, the, not the, the the original dissidents or dissidencias uh, that didn't get involved in the agreement. But the ones that did sign the agreement, but after that they went away, and they uh, kept uh, they kept um, making a lot of things. Uh, so people is saying if if they already got something and they sort of didn't want it, so now what do they want, uh, and what are we gonna give to them? And and of course in the political debate, in the social debate, in the cultural debate, for people is too easy to say, of course, he was a guerrillero, he was a guerrilla man, and he, he likes to give away everything because that's what he did and that, that's what he got when he demobilized, he demobilized from M19. 
so I think he's in he's in a position to to take risks, uh, to know up to some point how these groups work. The uh, ELN is especially difficult, uh, but uh, but it, it, it's it's challenging for him too. I don't know, Robert, but what can you say more? Yeah, that's great. I mean, one other way I could I could contextualize this is in more of a historical perspective. You know, it'd be interesting 20 years from now how we look back at sort of you now potentially three longer term overlapping political projects. One is Colombia's 1991 constitution, which was shaped in large part by former fighters from the N19 guerrilla movement, which Petro was a member of. Um, this is one of Latin America's most progressive constitutions, um, but it it didn't sort of, it has never been fully implemented. It was a brief moment where the M19 had a lot of political influence uh, in the early 90s, but that promise, their effort to remake the, co the country through the constitution has never been uh, fully uh, applied. Now, the peace accord of 2016 with the FARC was seen as possibly an attempt to fulfill some of that lost promise, particularly in uh, what the accord itself referred to as closing the gap between the city and the countryside. And now we have Petro's push for total peace. So again, it's we we don't know even the, the how the total peace is going to play out as Felipe said and as I alluded to but you know sort of thinking along these short, medium and, and longer term, you know, 30 year, 40 year time horizons, I think it's going to be very interesting to sort of see what plays out. And and one thing I want to emphasize that, that came up in Felipe's talk as well is that the 2016 peace accord was not just about the FARC. In fact, the FARC is not mentioned in the majority of the accord. Rural reform is one of the main points, but then also sort of the opening of a more democratic political space. That connects back very well to the 1991 uh, constitution. Okay. Uh, Julia, do you have anything to add or would you like us to move on? There's actually a particular question for you here. I just saw that. So actually just for, for time, let's move on to the one that was directed to me because I, I don't have much to add beyond what's already been said. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is this is going to be very, very interesting. Um, uh, I think we will have to look back and, and, and take stock of, of what Petros can, can do. Okay, Dr. Neil Harvey asks, First, thanks to you all for your insightful work. Um, my question is for Julia. He says, you mentioned that in the plebiscite that no campaign attacked the broad inclusion of women's goals in the accords. Did the revised version of the accords reduce the presence of women's demands in their text? Has this impacted the subsequent struggles for justice for women? So as I mentioned during my presentation, this is a longer conversation perhaps for another day, but and, and that what I mean by that is that within um, Colombia, there really is this um, kind of loose coalition of religious groups, political and economic elite, um, and transnational religious groups, which have been mobilizing around the um, around backtracking on specific progressive rights that have been made over the last number of years in Colombia. And so um, some of this relates to increased LGBT rights. Um, again, on the books or on paper, often much more than in terms of lived experience. Um, some of this is around women's sexual and reproductive rights. Um, and again, so when it came to this inclusion of the so-called gender ideology within the peace accords, a term that was never used, um, this was really um, kind of harnessed by these groups who were linked to the No campaign, who were linked to former president Alvaro Uribe and his political uh, block. And so this was another piece of the puzzle that got the fire kind of lit under certain people to go out and vote no. However, um, and the other thing that was happening at the exact same time is that the Constitutional Court had put out a sentence to the Ministry of Education just a few months earlier saying that they had to start to integrate anti-bullying programs uh, for LGBT children. Um, in schools. And this led to a lot of protests, a lot of marches around the same time, again, with this question of ideology, um, gender ideology, sorry, in really kind of black and white um, gross terms, you know, the kind of narrative was if you vote yes for the peace accord, um, you're, you're voting to let the state make your child gay. And that, you know, really was not the, <laughs> the reality. 
Uh, and so what's interesting is that while these groups were successful in not letting some of those educational reforms, some of those anti-bullying programs go through, um, they sort of backfired in a certain way when it came to the inclusion of women's rights and also, which I haven't spoken about, but LGBT rights within the accord itself. Um, those extra few months between when the when the no vote won on October 2nd and when the final accord went through in December gave women's groups and LGBT rights groups time to sort of um, clarify and rewrite and be more strategic in their inclusion of a gender perspective. And Elizabeth Corredor, who recently got her, her PhD out of Rutgers, writes you know, really brilliantly about this. So I would suggest checking out her work because um, this is her real area of expertise. And so what we see is that the final accord didn't actually get rid of the, the essence of these different, uh, these different uh, provisions for women's rights, this gender perspective. I would say to the question though, so it, it's not the question of whether it was included or not in the text, what the real um, problem has been, has been an implementation. And so when the Duque government came in in 2018, um, and really slowed down uh, much of the implementation of the peace accord in general. But uh, kind of, if you look at, again, at the crop reports and the monitoring matrix, this is disproportionately so when it comes to the specific gender provisions, that's where we see that it has had this, um, the impact or the, the lack of impact it was supposed to have um, when it comes to including a gender perspective in this moment of, of transition towards peace. May I, may I have to say something here as well about sort of some broader political contexts? So th I think there, there are a couple ways to that we might envision the effects of a Petro presidency from uh, 2022 to 2026, as opposed to if he had indeed won the 2018 um, elections. On the one hand, uh, the Duque administration, for as much as it was talking about the peace accords internationally, really worked against implementation at home. So the most effective uh, form of fighting coca and the drug trade is the voluntary substitution program. So the state paying farmers, there were no payments or very few payments made uh, under uh, the Duke administration. The peace accord included an important provision for what was called a uh, national committee on security guarantees, which was going to try to sort of coordinate government efforts to dismantle the kinds of political relationships and support networks that had allowed paramilitary successor groups uh, to continue operating after the 2006 accords. So, you know, there's been a lot of damage to, I think, the possibilities for implementation of the 2016 accords. On the other hand, if Petro had been in office during the first couple of years of the pandemic, you know, I think any chance for a total peace would have proceeded very differently because a lot of the the culturally conservative other right wing groups that Julia referred to that fought against uh, the accords and won the no vote in 2016 and then uh, sort of continued to win the presidency in 2018, they have exhausted their political uh political goodwill. Um sorry, one of my former students is here. Here's my cat Jamie. Um uh so it was both the, the pandemic, also repression of popular protests in 2020 and especially uh, uh, and especially 2021. So is, I think, you know, the two is is one better than the other. You know, a Petro presidency in 2018, would it have been more sort of effective in achieving total peace than the a Petro presidency beginning in 2022? Again, we're going to have to wait and see on that. Thank you. Um, Here's another uh, a question that that seems uh, really interesting and relevant, and, and it's, a lot of these are just trying to gauge, right? Uh, and of course, you, you might not have any concrete answers because we we're still in a waiting to see pattern. But um, but they're trying to gauge about the the Petros presidency. Um, this is from uh, David Aviles. Is the Colombian Senate approval of the environmental Escaso agreement assigned that the legislature is strongly behind President Petro's peace and protection policies, or this is just, do you see this as completely different um, things? And it was to the panelists, so. Excuse me, could you repeat the second part of the question? I got until the, the, the Escaso agreement. Yeah, is, is this a sign that the legislature legislature is strongly behind President Petro's peace and protection policies? In other words, is it a sign that they're going to 
go along with him uh, as more and more legis uh, legislation gets introduced. That would put us in a difficult position to analyze how our Congress works. And how are they really committed to make decisions over what they think it's better for the country, it's better for a progressive agenda, or if they're more for the, I don't know, for the bureaucracy, um, for the, and, and, and it starts, we see, for example, I'm talking about some of, the, some of the groups that Julia mentioned earlier. Uh, right now they are passing a um, tributary reform, a tax reform, uh, and one of the uh, one of the, the the articles that some of the um, of the congressmen and women uh, congress people wanted to pass was about uh, taxing churches uh, for their commercial activities, and it made huge debate. But at the end, a group of parliamentaries, a group of congress people, uh, said, uh, "If you pass this article, the uh, could make uh, the whole tax reform go away uh, because they are being pushed by by, by other interests. So uh, there are things that are, are very um, mediatic, like uh, the, the Escazú uh, agreement uh, that Ivan Duque didn't want to pass. Uh, so uh, Gustavo Petro kind of had to make it. But in the, in the short future, we don't really know how that's going to play. Um, and um, in in some time, like uh, in one or two years, uh, no, maybe maybe less, like in one year, we're going to have uh, local elections, uh, and uh, representatives uh, in in the Congress may need to to move an agenda that gives them votes in their local uh, towns or cities, and it might not coincide with with what uh, Mr. Petro wants to do. So. We don't know yet. It, it, it's been like three months of, of his presidency, uh, and there is there are many risks of, of Congress people wanting to to advance their their own interests, as usually happens here. Yeah, if I can sort of build on that, um, Petro just passed his hundred day in office. I think his approval ratings at like sixty one percent. He is for at least this moment enjoying in some ways a commanding majority in Congress. Um, so this, yeah, to the extent I, I saw him being able to make uh, progress on his agenda, it was gonna be, you know, in these first three, six months up till probably the midterm, Colombian midterm elections. I think actually this hadn't occurred to me since last week, the fact that the Democratic Party in the US held, held on to the Senate uh, could actually create more political space for Petro because you're not going to have an emboldened um, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, these voices that are very hawkish um, on Colombia. So you know, that might be in sort of thing about the international context, a, a reason for hope. But it, it's it's remarkable just looking at Colombia as Colombia. Um, Petro is not going to be able to hold the coalition together forever for precisely the reasons Felipe outlined. But um, I don't know if we could have a imagine, you know, a more successful 100 days uh, in, in some ways. Maybe, but uh, I think Petro has been remarkably um, productive so far. Okay, so uh, there's another question uh, directly to Julia. Uh, as you have been working, this is from Luna Casey. As you have been working with women peace builders for a long time, my question is, what future challenges might these women face if such exclusion continues in Colombia? Hi, Luna. It's nice. I don't see you, but nice to know that you're here. Um, I think that this question uh, can be answered when it comes to all social leaders, kind of men and women. and. Um, but when it comes specifically to women, these are this is the kind of the area I work in and, and what I know about. So one of the things is this question of guarantees of protection, guarantees of security. And this was included in the peace accord. Um, we had the government create the, the national protection unit, which would assign people who had been threatened or who had credible threats of violence against them from different armed groups, they'd be assigned you know, a cell phone and a, a bulletproof vest, or they get assigned a bodyguard, or they get assigned an SUV and uh, bodyguards, different kind of security. 
protocols. And one of the big problems that a lot of the women I work with talk about is that these are not gender sensitive. So very basic, bulletproof vests don't fit women's bodies and they're really, really uncomfortable if you're in you know, 35 degree weather with 100% humidity, it doesn't work. Two, a cell phone doesn't work if you have no cell signal. Uh, and thirdly, um, you know, another example is that often the SUVs, these big cars that they're assigned are the same cars that used to be driven by paramilitaries 10 years ago. So communities won't have them coming in in these cars. They, they're afraid of them. These are really basic um, kind of small, perhaps small seeming uh, problems. But for the women I work with, this lack of protection, this lack of gender sensitive protection is a huge barrier to their ability to implement their work. If they are afraid for their families, if they're afraid because they've got threats against them, if social leaders are being killed in the hundreds around the country around them, um, that is a big barrier to mobilization. And what I'd say is that the women I work with continue to push forward. They don't necessarily have ideas of stopping, but as security conditions um, you know, stay the same or continue to get worse, those barriers to, to participation increase. I think one other thing I would talk about is the question of financing. Um, and so internationally, after the peace accord was signed, there was a whole lot of, um, perhaps it's cynical to say international marketing, but there was a whole lot of interest in making sure that the Colombian peace agreement you know, worked and that it that it was successful. And so there was a lot of international cooperation money coming in. And some of this was going specifically to women. So for a lot of uh, embassies and international um, kind of kind of cooperation money, there was this gender component that had to go to the women peace builders. It had to have this gender focus on it. A lot of the way that money was given out was in kind of six month or one year stints. It was very technical. It had massive monitoring and evaluation. Um, kind of ties on it. And so a lot of the women I work with have said that that is also a barrier, that kind of short term uh, funding, which means that they're spending a lot of their time, first of all, focusing on priorities that are being um, kind of imposed from New York or uh, Geneva, which absolutely have the best intentions in mind, but don't always fit the very local and specific um, kind of gendered security problems. And secondly, which isn't uh, sustainable. And then I would say with that as well, you know, it's been six years since the peace accord was signed. And again, without wanting to sound cynical, um, there are new priorities. The war in Ukraine is a big international priority. What happened in Afghanistan is a big priority and international money for continuing with these peace builders programs, which are not usually financed by uh, the government. They're financed by women themselves and civil society through international donations. Uh, that money is becoming kind of uh, harder to access. And so I think it's both a question of ongoing security problems and resourcing that I think is going to continue to present challenges. Again, cautiously optimistic. If, you know, this total peace can be implemented by Pedro and Marquez in the way that they, they said that they want to and security conditions do improve, then I would see this as opening up more civil society space for peace building for um, engaging in economic empowerment and political participation and, and those sorts of programs with this gender focus. However, I would say that there is fatigue um, around the social leaders, at least I work with. Again, not just women, men as well, but when we take that specific gender focus, we do see that there are other components to what's going on that make, that make it challenging. Thank you. I am, um, we're almost, on time, but uh, I had, of course, there's the million dollar question here that always happens. Uh, uh, and that if we can all resolve right now, right here, we would probably all get the Nobel Peace and Prize, uh, Nobel uh, yeah, Peace Prize. Um, so I'll, I'll ask it, but then I'll, I'll ask all of you if you have anything else for uh, last comments for closure. Um, how effectively and in what way can the Colombian government reduce drug violence as long as there is an international demand for the product. Of course, um, I know this very well in Mexico, it happens the same way. So any suggestions here? I mean, <laughs> It's just a, a simple question. I think just a simple answer, I guess, is just like implement the peace process. Um, I think in part, you know, one of the things that really sticks out, and again, I do always come to this with a gender focus, 
is recently when I was in Cauca, right before the elections, one of the things that a lot of the women were talking to me about was that for their children, for their young um, adults, their kind of teenagers in their communities, when the land is, when there's, there's no money in, um, in kind of staying in these rural areas, there are a lot of incentives for young people to join armed groups and to become involved in these kinds of, um, you know, illegal, yeah, illegal groups. Um, not necessarily because they hugely want to, but because it's that there aren't options. And so I think thinking about rural reform, thinking about land reform, thinking about making staying and living in rural parts of Colombia a feasible life project, and particularly with this focus on young people, that is one of the places, at least where the women I was talking about were really, really focused and really highlighting. I think it's a much more complex question than that, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. Yes, I, I think that's that's the basis. And, and we've been fighting for that like the, the last uh, five years. And, and, and we're saying like, we've been saying like, please implement the, implement the, the, the agreement and, and we'll see if that works. But I think you, you're adding a, a, a difficult element uh, that that goes with the with the international demand, because I was I was reading recently an article about how um, Popayan, a traditional city, the capital of the, of the Department of Cauca, uh, is being uh, I don't know uh, submerged by by uh, narco traffic uh, money recently and. Is it's not about kids that don't have education or don't have a job. It's just that uh, illicit drugs pay more. Uh, illicit drugs gave them uh, some uh, sense of power, of acceptation that they don't get uh, through through regular working. And and I think every day is more difficult. I mean, we of course have to implement the, the, the peace agreement, but it needs to go beyond that. Uh, of course, uh, we have to start thinking about legalization, but uh, the legalization in just Colombia wouldn't solve the problem uh, because it would it would be profitable outside uh, still. So uh, we need all the help we can get, mm, and we need to start uh, to we need to, to to start thinking differently about that. Uh, but it's a difficult question <laughs> for real. It's it, it's so hard to imagine a, a world in which, uh, like uh, I don't know, cocaine is uh, legal goods that can be exported. Uh, that was a recent um, proposal by the director of like our IRS, uh, Ladian. Uh, he said like we have to legalize cocaine and start uh, charging tax for the for that. It's hard to think in, in a world that uh, allows to do that. But I think that would be a bit closer uh, to, to, to avoid that, the violence that come from drugs. I, nothing, for time reasons, there's nothing I would add. I, very thorough um, and very productive. Well, I, I, I wanna really thank uh, the three of you. You had not only given us wonderful perspectives, but um, really interesting deep aspects of the complexity of of the conflict in Colombia and the complexity of actually uh, finally hopefully at some point in the near future bringing uh, uh, the peace accords to actual fulfillment even if it's just small steps at a time um, uh, I want to thank you so much for for doing this. Uh, uh, you know, on behalf of NMSU, on behalf of the Center for Latin American and Border Studies, I I really thank you. I want to give you a, one last chance to to close with anything. We're on time, but if you want to say something, let me know. Julian, no, Car uh, Robert, Felipe. I just like to to take on the the the. Um realistic optimism, a cautious optimism that Jude was talking about. Uh, we really hope that this, this, this changes in the in the close future. As Robert was saying, these three last months uh, have given uh, good lights about what's coming. Uh, and, and we hope it, it goes in that, dire go that in, in that direction because there is still a lot of job to do. Uh, one last thing, maybe uh, we need to start focusing so much on the work of the HEP, uh, special jurisdiction for peace. If this one goes to jail, if this one doesn't, uh, 
or what did what did Uribe say? Did he acknowledge his crimes or or didn't he? While we still have so greater challenges in the territories, the ones we have done. So um, I think that would be. Yes, as we all know, peace and reconciliation, peace agreements without reconciliation are problematic. So it's, it's, it is a process, right? It's a, it's a long process. And for all of us uh, and all Colombians, I, I, I do hope that this process starts moving along in, 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 in incremental steps towards a, 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 a good development for, for the country. It's time. I think it is time. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Solver, Dr. Carl, uh, Mr. Carranza. We uh, invaluable talk, uh, a great uh, insights. So I really, really want to thank you for your participation. And I hope maybe we can do another panel in a year or so and we can see, take stock exactly of where we are. To our participants, to, a todos nuestros participantes, muchas gracias por haber participado, gracias por estar aquí y quedarse algunos minutos más de, de lo que les habíamos prometido. Thank you so much for all of our participants for being here, for staying a little longer than, than, than what we uh, had told you this conversation uh, was going to be. Uh, on behalf of myself and all of my colleagues from the Center for Latin American and, and Border Studies here at NMSU, I thank you. And, you know, this was the last talk of the semester. We will come back with more talks, three other important talks next semester. So I hope you join us and uh, we will see you soon. Hasta luego, muchas gracias. Espero que nos, nos veamos pronto el siguiente semestre, ya que esta fue nuestra última plática de este semestre. Gracias a todos. Um, hasta luego. <laughs>